Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marinkoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Technology. That's the term. Everybody wants to invest in tech. Everything is coming out. They read WeWork, uh, you know, Rheology. The Coastal was old. Okay, these honest buildings. All of these new products. Fundrise. All these programs. So today, with the help of my executive producer, Mr. Beckerman, I am having a show on technology and real estate. Where it is today? I have Sandy Jackalow, who is the chief informational officer at Silverstein Properties and Silverstein Technologies. Michael Rudin, who is the Senior Vice President at Rudin Management and Rudin Ventures. From Maryland, but living in New York these days. Jeff Berman, who is the General Partner at Camber Creek and a Vice President at Berman Equities. And last but not least, the man who assembled this group of people, the guru in tech, <laughs> my friend Michael Beckerman, who is the CEO of CRE Tech. So, you're the statistician also today. How much <laughs> oh, was geez. invested last year in tech? A about lot. Tremendous a amount. A billion and a half? Well, I think if you look at, you know, you got to break up the different categories. I think if you looked at all of real estate tech, probably okay. in the billions. Would you say the article in Forbes says that it's 50 times the amount that was invested eight years ago? I would say that would absolutely be accurate. How long have you been involved in tech? We started investing in real estate tech in 2009. Really, that's when we were starting to understand the ecosystem that was starting to be formed. It was really at its embryonic stage. Um, we didn't make our first investment until 2011. So why do you invest in tech companies? I mean, you were saying to me prior to the show, you, you, have to, you only invest in companies that you can use their product. Right. So as real estate operators ourselves, we understood the pain of inefficiencies in, in management. And we started looking at a variety of companies that were coming out, and we thought, well, if we can use these companies within our portfolio matrix, why wouldn't we also invest in them to be able to take advantage of the upside as well? So let's talk about how do you make a determination what you like? I mean, I understand you want to use it for your business. So I have two young guys come to you and they say, I have the great new widget, okay? Tell me about the widget. How do you sit there and, and make the determination that maybe I should invest? How long does it take? What's the cycle? I'm going to ask you, too, the same question because it's really for all three of you. Well, I think 
every situation is different. Sometimes that realization that this is a product and a team that's investment worthy comes pretty quickly and sometimes it takes a lot of deliberation. Obviously it starts with the team. So you meet with the CEO, the founders, etc. And then you understand where the product can be applied specifically germane to us within our portfolio matrix. So if we're looking, let's say, at an energy management solution, the first thing we ask ourselves is, can we actually use it? And then we do a pilot. We partner with the startups even before we invest. And then once we partner, we get an idea of, can we use this or can we not use this? And interestingly, there's a company that approached us last year uh, as an investment uh, prospect, and we have still not been able to start the pilot. We've been working with them for over a year. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that it might not necessarily be a great investment, but the technology might end up working and driving efficiencies in our portfolio, but we're certainly not going to look at it from an investment perspective at the moment. Speaking of technology, I was reading that one of the companies that I believe you've invested in is a company that reads the, the, um, the atten- when people walk into a building so you can figure out how much energy you should use. Let's talk about that and how you decided to use that. Well, that is actually our own company that we, we created ourselves uh, starting back in 2010, and it's called Nantum. Uh, and it's a building uh, operating system. Uh, and the, one of the core aspects of it is uh, uh, the correlation between occupancy and HVAC uh, and the amount of uh, fresh air uh, you're supplying into a building or a space. Um, and we never would have really put those two uh, different data sets together if we didn't have a way to visualize them. And that's really what, what Nantum has allowed us to do is, is see in real time uh, what's going on in our buildings uh, and allow disparate systems uh, that have never really historically <coughs> spoken to each and other to correlate. Did you self-fund that or you went out to We have self-funded it to date, um, but you know, we're, we're, we're still sort of figuring Did out people what. like my friend over here from Silverstein utilize that product? Uh, I'm not sure if Silverstein uses it. We've had discussions with them, but we do have a number of other property owners who are, who are all piloting it right now. What, what investments have you invested in, Sandy? Uh, we've looked at a couple of different things from um, things that provide self-service. You know, one of the interesting changes from WeWork over the last couple of years is our commercial clients, our residential clients want self-service. So we've looked at things like the guarantors that make it easy for people renting in our buildings to get a guarantee. Uh, Rent-A-Go, which provides self-service for the tenant, for our residents. So a lot Explain of things- Explain Rent-A-Go. Rent-A-Go, so basically when, you're, or when you own a residential building, Uh, Tenants want work orders, easy way to pay online. They want to do it through an app. They don't want to have to call a management office. They want to be able to do it at their time. They want to be able to, you know, we live in New York City, so so many of the young young kids out there are sharing apartments. They want to be able to each pay their own rent, not have to worry about transactions. Oh, you pay the rent and I'll write you a check. These applications handle all of that for you, so it makes it so much easier for them to just run run their daily life and incorporate real estate as just part of it. Do you have an investment committee who helps you make a decision? If someone's watching my show and they want to have an opportunity to meet with you or to meet with Michael, how, how do they go around this? How, how does this start, the process? Uh, from that perspective, they need to have a business plan. They need to have a product that's actually working. And then for us, there is an investment committee. But aside from that, if it's something that relates, let's say, to the operations of our building to get through the turnstiles, we'll bring our operations department into it. We'll also get involved from an IT perspective to see if we're going to connect the data between systems or even from a cybersecurity perspective. Yeah, I mean, sort of like Jeff mentioned, every, every, every company, every deal is different, right? Um, generally, similar to, to Jeff and, and Sandy, we want to look at and partner and, and potentially pilot and invest in companies that have a product that is, is live and working. Um, we haven't to date invested in, in just an idea um, and generally, if the f- timing works out, we like to be able to pilot a technology either before making an investment or sort of alongside of, of making an investment. And similar to uh, what Michael and Sandy said, I also like to meet with founders when they are at the ideation stage. Uh, we're fully transparent that we don't invest in the ideation stage, but I like to stay close so, because you can, you can develop so here's a Here's a question for you and Michael. If I'm listening to your philosophy, you only want to invest in companies that you could do business, you can use on your own business. You wouldn't invest with an Airbnb? 
because I was reading one of the articles talking about the different type of programs. You know, certain people who invested in Airbnb, they, they were really, you know, looking in the hospitality business over there. And I heard that Barry Sternlich today invested in a company similar to that. So you have the Airbnb, and then you have the WeWork. Now, you're really into the similar business of WeWork. Well, we actually have one of our portfolio companies is called Y Hotel, which lives or can live on the Airbnb, VRBO, et cetera, platforms. And the idea behind it is, if you're a multifamily developer, and you guys know this, the, the most painful part of the process is after the building's built, you have the lease up. And the lease up can take anywhere between, let's say, eight months and 24 months. And you're burning capital that entire time. So Y Hotel was founded with the idea that you could create these pop-up hotels and slowly as you increase revenue in the building because you're using these, these non-occupied rooms as, as hotels, and then as the building leases up, the hotel dissipates. So we like that space, but again, it's something that we can use in our own portfolio as well. Here's a question. Is every company that we're seeing, we're calling them all tech, but not all of them are really tech, aren't they? You hear what I'm saying? It, they're really certain of them are changes in the brick and mortar. As I, I believe Sandy was saying to me earlier in the green room, you're changing the physical arrangement of your lobbies. You're changing the way your offices are structured. Is that tech or is that just evolving? Well, there's the physical aspect, which you know a, a lot of owners look at, obviously, in, in making sure that older products and buildings are you know still staying fresh and, and relevant and, and attractive to, to tenants but then there's the the technology component and you know you can make a physical change that is affected uh, or enabled by a technology but, product but so in, in the same manner different... would we consider convene a technology company there's a technology <clears throat> backbone there's a technology backbone but the majority of their business is not really tech today but it's, I it's, think it's, it's tech-enabled. Yeah, right? it's tech-enabled. So all these companies are tech-enabled. Airbnb is tech-enabled. WeWork is tech-enabled. It's all about data and understanding how your properties are actually being used. And what companies like Convene and other you know, companies who, who arbitrage the, the underutilized space, <clears throat> they're allowing property owners or property managers to actually have an understanding of how that space is most optimally optimally utilized, and that's via that's via some sort of technology right. backbone. Or I, I have two owners here, specifically owners. Have you used 10x? Yes. No. 10x is an auction platform, or was a I think it was the uh, subsequent auction. Yeah, the auction. It was an auction.com, right? Right, and uh, it was I believe it's owned by LNR, right? I think so. No, no, I think they were early. Now it's Thomas H. Lee. Thomas H. Right. So the the idea was that when comp, uh, properties went into special servicing or whatever, they ended up on. Uh, that was the I, initial, but right. then. Well, that's then, when we used it. We, right. we haven't used it in a number but, of years. But now it's evolved more to saying, you know what, the process that it takes to buy a building or to buy a property takes nine months right. over here. With 10X, you're able to list it. You can qualify based on quantitative analysis. Who are the likely buyers? Who are the likely sellers? Okay, and then you can go on, you can open up the Dropbox and do the auction. Right, and there are a number of companies that are, that are attacking this space as well. There's a company out of California called Crexy mm -hmm. that's Same also thing. in this space um, that has the uh, auction functionality. They have the purchase and sale functionality. And that, that's one of the ways that real estate is changing where there used to be, you know, if you were bidding for a property, information arbitrage was how you got an advantage. Now that information is all available online. So you have to figure out other ways to be able to. But you were talking to me about another interesting thing, which I think is a great process. In the world of banking, you, you need appraisals, okay? It's like title insurance. You, you need this type of coverage, even though it may be one man's opinion of what the value is on the cash flow and other future opportunities, but you've made an investment in, in an appraisal business. Yes, we made an, uh, an investment in a tech-enabled appraisal business. Much like Michael said, it's, it's a an appraisal business, but it's tech enabled. And what they did was they saw that appraisals, because they are necessary for pretty much every real estate transaction, but it was done in a very inefficient way, they created a natural language algorithm that shortened the process by almost 75%. And that enabled their customers to close a deal faster. So for, for the lenders, for the borrowers, for everybody involved, 
this was a win-win. I think it's, it's I think it has yep. a great power even for prospective purchasers mm -hmm. so they can qualify their lead initially because somebody says the building's worth this. Okay? You know what? I want an appraisal. It's going to take six weeks. Here now you can give this information beforehand. Well, the interesting thing also is that they are assembling a comp set that doesn't exist right now because if you think about how appraisals are done, right, guys, you, somebody goes out, they take pictures, they write the report, but it, it lives siloed. But Bowery is going to have this map of every appraisal that so they've done. So it's going to have this large database that people can... Specifically what Michael was saying before. Right. What other companies have you invested in? Uh, we've invested in Honest Buildings, uh, which is a uh, construction management and bid leveling uh, tool uh, that we really love. Um, Recently had a, a new round of... Uh, their Series B right. uh, funding uh, just uh, closed a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, we invested in a company called Enertiv, which is also in the building operating uh, management space. Um, we've invested uh, along with, with Jeff in a company called Latch. Uh, which right, is now Latch is the doors for the residential. Access, yeah. access, access control, access control platform, but they have a very big... So aspect. how is the inter interconnect between Latch and like uh, Alexa and Home? Latch is HomeKit enabled. Um, without giving too much away, uh, you know the CEO likes to keep things pretty close to his chest. But um, it's public information. The way, but the the way they're approaching it is that access control is a beachhead into the living and working environment of a resident or a tenant, and so if you can control that access, not just a, a simple key, but ecumenically from a from an entire building perspective then you have a visibility into the way a building operates and the way the tenants and residents operate within that building that up until now has really not been available. Sandy, what other companies have you invested in? Um, you know, we do two sides of it. One, we actually use products like Honest Building that we don't invest in, and there are some others that we do invest in with a slightly different strategy. You and I were talking about Hyper, uh, which does um, social media monitoring of influencers. So if you've got a marketing message to get out there and you have a very specific target audience, you can find those. Uh, the other thing that we're starting to look into, which Michael's aware of, with Rebney, we're actually getting ready to do prop tech challenges where we're going to create and put out problems that we need solved in the industry and look to start up companies over three months to actually create solutions. What do we need in the industry? What, what do you think is needed in the future products that should be created. Any idea? Mr. Beckerman, you can also. <laughs> uh, I think what's, what's needed is like, I think the phase that we're in right now is one where we're starting to get some adoption in the industry. So I think for the first time since I've been in the space for five or six years, you're starting to see the brokerage firms, the leading landlords are getting involved and starting to invest um, so I think it's, it's right now, it's more about market share. How do we get more people involved? I, I could definitely see the appraisal product. I can see a mortgage product where you can qualify a mortgage for residential people, uh, like Lone Tree or something like that. You know, Lending like, Tree. Inc. Or like Morty. Like yeah. Morty. But where do you see other products? What about the leasing? Do you see some technology for office leasing since you have a large portfolio yes, right. of office Yeah, there's a, yeah. a great business intelligence tool for, for office leasing called VTS, um, which almost, I think, you know, every, every landlord in the U.S. Is, is on their platform in some way, shape, or form. Uh, they've been around for uh, about four or five years now um, and are, you know, slightly different from their initial product. Um, their initial product was sort of a marketing tool, uh, and they realized quickly that, that owners and managers wanted to have a dashboard where they could see in real time again what's going on across their portfolio from a, a leasing perspective and a prospect perspective, um, and uh, and you know from from the leasing standpoint they're they're the market leader uh, in that space. And what about companies like Cadre, okay, which is you know changing the private equity formula in a different manner where they're charging a management fee of let's say one and a half percent, and they're also charging only a one and a half percent fee. Uh, on the profitability as opposed to the 80-20, you know, the fight, that situation. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, you know, in its simplest form is, is crowdfunding for, uh, for, for real estate. I mean, Cadre has a little different, you know, you need to be a quali qualified to a certain degree. Um, but there are a variety of companies that are out there that are allowing 
people who haven't historically had the access to right, but that, real that's, estate. You see, cadre is wanting larger investors. Right, I think right. they, they want qualified investors, you know, accredited investors, as opposed to the fundrise. I think which it's is crowdfunding at just at a higher it's, level. It's, it's a different, it's it's a a different, different level, level of crowdfunding, yeah. okay? It's, it's more sophisticated. When, when you're putting in a, a new product, we were talking about your, your Silver Towers over yeah. there on 42nd Street. Now you're, you're doing some changes. What, what tech services are you utilizing? We've actually done a couple of different things where a, some of this was developed in-house using tools like Salesforce and MRI and OnSite. We've actually, for the first time, connected all the products so they can talk to each other. So now all of a sudden, we're able to lay on some business intelligence and you know, artificial intelligence machine learning to really understand what's going on in our building. And then when you connect that to our digital marketing on Facebook and Google AdWords, you really can start to sense where the people are coming from and actually change your leasing strategies fairly much on the fly these days. It's Which unlike what we were talking about equity residential. Uh, they, they're so sophisticated to the point that they change their rents based on the algorithms that they have on who's moving in and out, mm -hmm. also on their amount of money they give off for um, concessions and so on. Mm -hmm. You actually mentioned a critical point, which is having these different systems talk to each other. One of the things is, as landlords, you get overwhelmed by the amount of, oh, we have a new dashboard here and we have a new product here, and you end up with a dozen different products that don't speak with each other. And that's because we are still at the infancy of where CRE tech can go. We're not in that, uh, in, in that environment where they're all speaking to each other. Uh, I'll that's give really you a very good example. Are, in the healthcare system, in the hospital system, there's a system called Epic. And there's another system which is a competing system. They don't talk to each mm -hmm. other. Right. So what happens is if you're in a, in a hospital system that Epic, they have all of the medical records. There hasn't been the interconnect between the other company. So I think you need that. We hear the term artificial intelligence uh, and AI. Okay, explain to my audience what artificial intelligence is. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a concept that I think is largely misunderstood. It's basically having the algorithms that can interpret data by themselves without a human looking at all the disparate forms of data. So it's a machine that can analyze information and give you recommendations. So, uh, so recommendations. here it comes into something that Sandy was talking about. You have this machine, you have this information, you have these hackers out there. You have security. How do you protect this article? Well, I think that's going to be the biggest <laughs> industry we, to come, actually. We spend a lot of time on cybersecurity. We have guidelines. In fact, you know, Rebney has a cyber uh, security committee. We've put together guidelines so when systems are talking to each other, data is encryption, simplistic things like password policies, locking things down so that only point A can talk to point B. It is probably the biggest concern a lot of us have, particularly as the data starts to talk to each other and connect. Well, I think and data and money concern. flowing between yeah. the tenant and the landlord, I mean, that's... Well. Speaking of that, what about VR, virtual reality? You're utilizing it a little bit? We, we've started to, we've started to do some t uh, 2D um, virtual reality. Now, with the goggles or as you were saying on the computer? Without the goggles, once they become more like glasses, it's going to explode and that's really going to be the, be the defining moment for it. But we saw a tool last week where they've actually been able to start to build in traffic patterns. So let's say 300 cars an hour down a particular street. So you can actually understand how your community actually interacts with people, pedestrians, traffic during the different times of day. So it's intriguing, it's got a lot of possibilities, but clearly the wearing the goggles side. is tough. Michael, yeah. wait, wait, Take it for off. example, when you did the Greenwich Village property, did you use virtual reality? We did not use virtual reality at the time, which this is now uh, almost five years ago when we were building out the marketing uh, uh, collateral for that project. And I think even to, to some extent today, the quality that we were looking for in terms of, of what we were going to be delivering with that product was not quite there in the, from the VR standpoint. It's certainly gotten better and it changes by leaps and bounds every day. But even, you know, even today, at least products that we've seen are not really quite, quite there. And again, as you, know, you were asking about the goggles and Sandy mentioned, once they become like glasses mm. and you don't feel like but, you have this big clunky helmet the on your head. Uh, the Google glasses originally why didn't they come out? What, what was the failure of the Google Glass? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but part of the issue with VR and AR is that at the moment, like Michael was saying, the 
technology is still a little too early, and yeah. the solutions comp overcomplicate the problem even more than the problem currently sits. And so, current marketing collaterals are good enough, but once once it becomes mainstream, it's going to explode. Do we consider the co-working companies uh, tech businesses today? I would consider them tech enabled. Yeah, I would. Yeah. But it's all about data and and you know access. Sure, to, because to they clients. can figure out what kind of rents that they want to charge. They can figure out needs. But again, it's about how space is actually being utilized. Right, right. right. But it's isn't really space down. being today is being utilized in a different way? I mean, years ago, a partner's office in a law firm was 280 square feet. Today, it may be 150 square feet. So you're determining different numbers and everything. Well, it's even less square footage, but a lot of it's about the self-service of the amenities. Amen. They just want to be able to pick up their phone and say, I want this conference room or I want this workstation. And that's where WeWork has done such a great job mm -hmm. with technology. And then as they start to collect all this data, they can really shift how they design their spaces or where they need to add services or remove services that just aren't being utilized. And I think, Michael, I'm sorry, I think that's one of the biggest trends that's to come is the concept of the office space, I mean, these are the experts, becoming more like a hotel? Because I think right. that's what the millennials want. I think that's what we work well, and the other co-working uh, It's the hospitality right. of office space where you might, have, you might have a tower and a floor or two or three might be a WeWork or might be a Notel, mm -hmm. and Please, they will live they're, they're under silver, that. There's silver props, okay? You know, silver, you know, silver, silver We actually have amenity spaces now. We've been doing a pilot where it's yoga classes, yeah. it's yeah. social yeah. gatherings, it's and yeah. you know, there's an app, they sign up for the yo yoga classes. Actually, the minute they come out a couple of weeks in advance, they book up literally within an hour. Blockchain, what is blockchain? Everybody <laughs> says blockchain. <laughs> Do we have enough time? We, we have a minute. I think that's, I think that's an entire show on, yeah. uh, on blockchain. In a, in a quick comment, what is blockchain for the... Well, blockchain is, it is a, a way, it's a distributed automated. ledger uh, for information, um, but it's going to have a pretty strong effect on the way real estate is transacted, but not anytime soon, I don't think. Right, when agree? I did a show, uh, yeah. as I told Sandy, on healthcare emerging trends, the healthcare leaders were talking very much on blockchain. They, they need it for the medical records and for the informational purposes that I said before, which is helpful. Even though the patient records don't talk, they're able to analyze more information. So look at all the investments that it's had in, in 2017. Five years from now, where do you see technology in real estate? Well, I mean, you know, I just take one step back. Uh, when I got in this, Michael, in 2011, 12, there was a handful of sites. And it was very hard to get anybody's attention. Uh, even when I would go to places like Silicon Valley and you would try and talk tech to the real estate people, they wanted nothing to do with this. So today, literally today, being on your show, of course, I think we've reached the pinnacle of uh, the sector. It's a, we track, it's a totally different ballgame. We track, I think, 2,000 startups today. The amount of money that's going in. So I think where it's going in a couple years is, I think it's going to be, tech is going to be like GPS. It's going to so, be, everybody's so, going to have it. It's going to be everywhere. So I'm going to ask for your help and the other gentlemen over here to do a show in a couple of weeks where you bring to the show some tech companies talking early stages or growth on wh where they stand. Cool. I think yeah. that will be interesting. That would be great. I'd like to thank, thank Sandy, you. Michael, Jeff, and needless to say, Mr. Beckerman. <laughs> thank you for having being us. Being here. See you next week. That was